So I want to tell you about Love Canal. Most of you were not born during Love Canal, but I want to tell you about Love Canal, but not just about Love Canal, but how Love Canal 30 years ago, it's the 30th anniversary of Love Canal. So how 30 years ago, what we were doing in this small community in Niagara Falls, New York, and what we were struggling against is the same fight that's going on today. The exact same fight. The same regulatory people are making the same decisions based on the same analysis as they were 30 years ago. You think in 30 years we would have come a long way, but we haven't. The way that we think about people in our society, people who are of low wealth, low income, low resource, people of color, are being treated today the same way they were treated 30 years ago. And I'm going to tell you the Love Canal story that will show you how that is so. My husband worked in the chemical industry. We said we need to buy a house. And so we went to the city of Niagara Falls and we bought our very first home on 101st Street in the LaSalle section of the city of Niagara Falls. Now, when we moved in, my son was very healthy. My husband was gainfully employed, but we worked, he worked in the chemical industry in Niagara Falls. Any of you ever been to Niagara Falls? Any of you noticed the smell in Niagara Falls, right? So, so when we smelled chemicals in Niagara Falls, we didn't smell climate change, toxics, cancer, death. We smelled a good economy. We knew as long as we could smell chemicals that our husbands were employed and that we'd be able to feed our children and pay our mortgage and so forth. So at the ripe age of 27, in this kind of environment, social environment, I felt immensely successful because I had achieved at 27 what my mother and father worked for decades to achieve. I had a husband gainfully employed, a healthy one-year-old baby. I had a house with a picket fence. I had a station wagon. Yes, we all had station wagons back in the day. I had a station wagon. I had HBO. It's the equivalent to the internet today. I mean, that was really huge. I had everything I could possibly want. And then my kids started getting sick. Michael developed asthma, epilepsy. He developed a urinary tract disorder, which required two operations to correct. He developed a liver problem. He developed an immune system problem, very much like we hear in HIV victims, AIDS victims, where his body was just sort of self-destructing and his, he had almost no immune system at all. In fact, they discharged him from the hospital and said, take him home because there's so many germs at the hospital, he's going to get sicker here. I tell you this story because while all this stuff is happening to Michael and Melissa and my neighbor's children with similar stories, the city of Niagara Falls, the county of Niagara, the state of New York, and the Federal Environmental Protection Agency all knew we were being poisoned. They all knew there were 20,000 tons of chemicals buried in our neighborhood. They all knew that it was leaking into the homes that surrounded the dump. The dump was essentially a rectangle in the center of the neighborhood. They all knew all of those government agencies, from the lowest to the highest, all knew that homes around the canal, the immediate homes surrounding the canal, had levels of chemicals in their air that had evaporated or volatilized into their air, were, would exceed workplace standards. Meaning that if you're a 160-pound man, which is what workspace, workplace standards are based on, you could only be in that home 40 hours a week. These exceeded, or that place, these exceeded those levels, and in those homes were women and men and infants and children 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they knew it. They made a conscious and deliberate decision to allow our families to be poisoned. The way they made that decision is the way they are making the decisions today about coal-fired power plants and who gets the mercury, 
about cleaning up rivers and creeks, who benefits? They're making those decisions today about energy issues. They are making those decisions today about product issues. They are making decisions today in government and in corporations based on the same criteria and analysis of Love Canal. Right now, all decisions are made when, when you're talking about cleaning mercury out of a river, when you're talking about air emissions or, or food. All decisions are being made at around the question of how much harm can we tolerate? So this is a good question for your scientists. How much harm can we tolerate? How much mercury can we handle before we get sick? How much dioxin can we handle before we get sick? How much chemical X can we handle before we as humans get sick, wildlife gets sick, marine life, or vegetation? We are saying that's the wrong question that we have to stop governing and regulating around that question. Because first of all, we don't know. We just don't know. Remember the lead, years ago, the lead contamination that was allowable was much higher than it is today because we thought we knew then how much lead children could be exposed to before they become lead poisoned. And over decades, it's been lowered and lowered and lowered, and it's about to be lowered one more time. We don't know. We just don't know. And so we are posing a question that says, instead of how much harm can we tolerate, how much harm can we avoid? 